God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. And if the stars are made to worship so light, I can see your heart in everything you Every burning star signal fire of grace And if creation sings your praises so will I Disappear. We lost your lives 
so I can find it here. And if you left the grave behind you, so Been watching the Olympics? Anyone else been watching the Olympics? Oh, there's a few. Oh, the Commonwealth Games, that's what I meant. Let's get, let's get the words right, okay. The Commonwealth Games, yeah. And, and it's interesting as you watch, I mean, uh, Australia got another gold last night, wasn't it, on the, in the 1500 metres? Yeah. Great what race that one was. But when you start thinking about racing, you know, particularly if it's a shorter sprint, how you start makes a difference. It's the start that can save you whether you're going to get to, uh, uh, to gold or to silver or to bronze. That start makes a big difference. And this message today... I just could, I tried to do two other messages. So I know that this is, is one of those times where it's for somebody here, and I trust it's more than just somebody, that it's for, for many of us. It's very basic in one sense. But the, the, the reality is, if you don't have a foundation right, the building gets shaky. And so what I want to talk about is a good start. A good start. You see, if we have a good start, it helps us to last the distance. I think it was um, Pastor Dougie who made a passing reference to one of the verses. Peter writes this in 2 Peter 1. It says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate, participate in the, um, if I can just read it properly here, Participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We're a unique people. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're a unique person. You've become spiritually alive. But how you are introduced to Jesus can be quite significant. You know, if we look around here in Australia... There's all kinds of, of Christian churches. And the way that you were introduced to Jesus could vary a degree. And sometimes it's just uh, all has been as a ritual. You see, if we uh, think about the, uh, the largest church, uh, Christian church, according to a census uh, in, in Australia, it would be the Roman Catholic Church. And they would introduce you to Jesus in some sort of way predominantly through infant baptism. 
And so, and so you can get uh, that and, and they will actually say, well, this is what saves you. This is what brings you into the church. That's the statement of belief that is being made. And so for the uninitiated, you start looking at all these different things. You, you can get a little bit confused. Why? Well, because the Anglican and the Uniting and the Lutherans, they still uh, do that as well, but they, they would practice... They would baptise children and adults by a sprinkling or a motion. So in one sense they're introducing people to, and then they're putting these things into place. Of course, if you were part of the Salvation Army, you don't baptise anybody. And you don't celebrate communion either. And so you start looking around and you say, well, why are all these different things there? And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not going into all those particular reasons. But you can understand why somebody who doesn't know anything or done research can get a little bit confused. How do I get to know Jesus? How do I get a good start in my Christian walk? Of course, then you come to the evangelicals and the Pentecostals and they baptise those who profess faith in Christ by immersion. So then you've got another group. So what, what do we do? How do we leave? Oh, what I want to do today is just come back to the basics. Come back to the early church, what they practiced, and let's just have a look at it. And you can listen to me and you can say, well, Pastor John, I don't know if I want to go all the way down that track. That's fine, but at least you have heard a message. At least you had heard what they did in the early church. And, and when God tells us to do certain things, it's for a purpose. It's to help us. He doesn't say don't do this because he's, he's a cranky old man. He says, no, don't do that because it's going to do you damage. So when he gives us some keys into how to start the Christian work, if he gives us those keys, it's for our benefit, not because he's making up a ritual. Everyone on, okay so far? All right. Let's have a look at it. The start of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the church in Acts, in Acts 2, 37 to 39. And this is the context straight after when the Holy Spirit was poured out Okay, and uh, they, they went out into the areas and people were asking what's going on and, and people had been received the Holy Spirit and they were all excited and they were declaring the wonders of God and, and, and spe speaking in, in tongues that they'd, they'd never learned. And Peter gets up and he gave uh, this uh, a great message. And this is the response. The people hear the message... And they said this, and when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is the very first thing. And, and I notice that there are, there are different aspects to what it is to be spiritually born. In fact, I believe there are four keys to the normal Christian birth. If, let's come back to the natural. We all know that, that babies can be born prematurely. And when they're born prematurely, they struggle. They struggle with life and you've got to give them a whole lot of extra attention. Sometimes if, it, if they're born too mature, they don't last at all. But even the ones that do, and, and they may come good at the end, but initially through that, uh, that, that period of time as they get, need to get stronger and stronger and stronger they, they've got to be cared for they're not as strong as they could have been and in our spiritual walk if you don't start well 
you're going to struggle. There's enough struggles out there already. The enemy's going to throw all sorts of things at you. And the Lord gives us some keys. This is how it works best. Now, we don't always get it, but let's hear what works best. The first thing you'll notice in that passage is that the people came under conviction. You see, the, the, these people were God-fearing people and they, they would be there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And, and Peter began to speak to them and, and uh, as, as he gave them that message, there had to be a response. And then that response is, what shall we do? It starts with every one of us. When we choose to follow Jesus Christ, it's like us saying, well, what, what have I got to do, Lord? What shall I do? And so it starts with a conviction. You see, these people that heard that message, you know, many of them would have heard of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus' reputation had gone through the Jewish world big time. Maybe they had gotten into a debate about Jesus. Oh, I don't... Some say he's the Messiah. Oh, I don't believe he's the Messiah. And you've got someone else on this side saying this. Oh, there's something about that guy. He's at least a prophet. And you can imagine the debate that's going on amongst the people. Some of those that were there may have been around when Jesus was crucified. They may have been there. But Peter managed to communicate to them in a way that they understood. He used some of the old uh, quotes from the Old Testament. And then the people saw the evidence of what was going on. They knew there was something special that was there. And the Holy Spirit brought the conviction. That has, has to start on this spiritual journey. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction. But there has to be a response. Of course, some people may respond in a negative way. See, if you say no to it, if you're like me, there's probably many promptings to give your life to the Lord and you didn't quite do it that time and then there's another chance came and then there was another chance that came. See, the call came out but you didn't respond to it. Your response wasn't positive. Your response was negative. No, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. And so the response we have, if you're going to join the Christian church, if you're going to work for Jesus, if you're going to be born again of the Spirit of God, is a response to the message. The next thing I see in this is this other C word, which is change. It says here that Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that word repent, we say we think we know what it means, but really sometimes we, uh, I wonder. It's a change of thinking followed by a change of direction. Now I think there's going to come up on the screen. Has anyone wanted to do that? Well, you can have it. I'm not, it's not on my bucket list to go jumping out of planes with parachutes or anything else. Okay, so it's not on my bucket list. But anyway, think about that. Think about the person coming. You, you, you've, you, you really want to do this. You really want to do this. And you've talked about it and you've talked about it. And you've got up into the plane and you've got to the plane and you've got the other people behind you encouraging you. Some might be me trying to push you. And, and you get right to the very edge and you look down and you see how far it is and you change your mind. That's what repentance is. I've changed my mind. I'm not. That person has repented. They, 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 even the way they talked and thought before that point is different after they say, no, I'm not going down that track. <laughs> I've repented. That is what it is. You see, when you really change your mind, it changes the way you think about things. When you really repent, it changes the way you talk about it. 
When you really repent, it changes the way you feel about it. When you really repent, it changes the way you act about it. That's what it looks like. You see, but, it, but it's more than just a mental game. It's, it's more than that. You see, it's, it's a changed thinking and it's a changed attitude and it's changed feelings. You, you, you feel different about uh, whatever it is that you're turning from. And it leads to change of values. This is what true repentance is. It leads to that. It doesn't say that um, you get it all perfect straight away. But when, you, when their repentance comes, it leads to that. Because why? I've got a change of thinking. I'm following Jesus wholeheartedly. Change of thinking followed by a change of direction. That's the way it works. It leads to a change in the way I live. These are key things, just basic key things. And so when we're introducing people to Jesus, when you first gave your heart to the Lord, did you understand those implications? See, sometimes we don't. And, and, and listen, um, if you didn't but you're still going on for God, that's good. But guess what? Guess what? When you get an understanding of it, you can apply it in different areas of your spiritual walk. Okay, Lord, yep, he's telling you to go down this track and you're resisting it. Well, when you change your mind and bring your mind into alignment with what he wants, you've repented. You've turned from that and you've gone down that track that he wants you to go. That making sense to anybody? Someone nod their head or do something? Okay, oh, there's a few nods, right out. Okay. So these very first Christians, they didn't have to change their mind about God. Why? Because they were there for a religious festival. They were there for the Feast of Pentecost. So they didn't have to be convinced about God. They knew he was there. The repentance that had to happen for them, remember these were Jewish people, was uh, about Jesus. They had to have a change of thinking about Jesus. They had to have a change of thinking. And as they, as they began to look at Jesus, we know that, that uh, their heavenly Father would be revealed to them in a deeper way because Jesus is the way to the Father. Have you seen that? And so here we have it. My voice is going up and down. Just excuse me a moment. So a question, <clears throat> do you have to change your mind about Jesus? You see, are you absolutely convinced that he is God the Son? Yes. That, he, that he has, you know, these are the questions. This, this is, and, and so if there are doubts coming into that, you, you, you've got to change your thinking. Because this is the way you move, keep moving forward. And you keep moving forward. Okay, here's the next part. Then we come to the, another C word, confirm. You see, the way you confirm your faith in Christ is by being baptised. That's the historical way you did it. You confirm your faith in Christ by being baptised. Sometimes, you know, because we've had these, these big rallies and all, all that sort of thing, you know, where people responded down the front and they've given their lives to Christ, um, and, and that's a good thing. Don't, don't get me wrong. But historically, the way that you demonstrated that, that you were fair dinkum in following Christ, was that you got baptised. You got baptised. I, uh, I read this story. I think there might be a photo. Y you know in the United States and maybe some bigger churches around Australia, I haven't seen it in Australia, but in the United States they not only have cathedrals uh, if you're part of the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church or whatever, but the Evangelical and Pentecostal churches, some of those big ones, can, they're big buildings and as part of their 
thing, they'd have this great big swimming, not a swimming pool, it's a, what's called a baptismal font. And that's what that is. Right at the right up up here they'll have a big baptismal font and, and it's all displayed it just looks like a, a small a swimming pool anyway I read this story that the pastor he was in one of the one of the offices nearby and 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 one of his assistants came to him and said pastor there's a woman trying to drown herself in the baptismal font oh he says oh I must be joking really so he comes out and sure enough, here is this lady trying to drown herself. She must have been high on something. And she's trying to drown herself in the baptismal font. Well, while he's looking there, he looks over and he sees another assistant coming from the office over there. And he decided, well, he's not going to jump in the water, clothes and all. And he's, he's gone to a change room. You see, these big churches have a change room near. He's gone to the change room to get some waders on so that they can get into the water to rescue the lady. Well, the minister knows that, hey, we've got to act pretty quick here. The other lady comes through the other corner. She's not going to jump in the water either. So the pastor comes. He bounces up onto the communion table and jumps into the water to rescue the lady. And he holds the lady up. They ring for the ambulance and they ring for the police. And police and ambulance are around and there's people everywhere. The pastor is just standing there dripping. They put a towel around him. They finally take the lady out. Then a police sergeant comes up to him. Puts his arm around him and says, Pastor, this would not have happened if you practiced sprinkling. Does the way you do it matter? Does it matter? Well, <clears throat> when God gives us a pattern, he's trying to communicate something to us so, so that we can use not just at the start, but right throughout our life. So let's have a look at what the pattern is. You see, firstly, baptism comes from this word called baptizio. And it literally means to dip, to immerse, to submerge. In, in fact, in, 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 uh, you know, in, in that era, they could say, oh, that ship baptizioed means it's submerged. That photo, that picture is there, is, it, is about dying and they used to use that terminology in, in dying fabric as they dipped the fabric into the dye it was called baptizios it's been baptizios it's been baptized that was the language and so that was the description and so if the word of god is using this 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 terminology it must mean something it's interesting to know this that sprinkling as a form of baptism was only authorised in some circumstances in 1311. That means prior to that time, immersion, baptizios, was the common practice. It took 1300 years for that to change. And yet now, perhaps within Christian circles, there may be more Christians that, uh, that practice the christening or the baby baptism or the, that sort of thing. Interesting where, where, where things are swung. But anyway, that's, that's something of the history. So when we look at this, when we look at baptism, what you are doing is, in, in a sense, is acting out a story. You're telling a story as you get baptised. Now, God's... Uh, uh, he, he tells us, communicate to the people of your day. And so Paul does that. And, uh, you know, in, in Acts uh, twenty two sixteen, Paul is giving his testimony to a bunch of people. They're not all just Jews, but some of those are Gentiles as well. And uh, he tells them his story of how he got converted. And, and he, tells, he puts this phrase in the midst of it in verse 16 of 22 and he says this now what are you waiting for get up 
be baptised and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Why did he use that terminology? I mean, isn't the correct theology is that being washed clean by the blood of the Lamb? Isn't that correct? Why did he use this terminology? Because in Jewish circles, they knew about these ceremonial washings and you would go through that process to become a practising Jew, even if you're an Italian or whatever. But also, within the religions of the day, they were familiar with this concept of, uh, of some sort of ceremonial washings. They had that concept in their mind. And so Paul, in seeking to communicate to them, he's saying, he says, get baptised and wash your sins away, calling on his name referring to Jesus. So he's trying to communicate to them that with baptism, what you do, you have a big bath, and when you have a big bath, you're getting all the grime of life off you. So you get washed clean. And when you come up out of the bath, guess what? The grime is left in the water. It's being left behind. That's the message that he's trying to put across. And so when you get baptised, that's what you're doing. You're painting a picture. I'm leaving the old grime of life behind. Paul expands on that even further then. In Romans 6, and he says this, Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see the picture being painted there. There's a picture of being joined joined with Christ, but then there is this picture of going into the grave, joining with Christ, going into the grave, but just as he was raised to life, coming up to a new life in Christ. You see, you know, there's, that, there's that picture. So if you've walked with the Lord for a while and you got baptised a while ago, are you using the fact of your baptism as a strategy against the works of the enemy who will try to come at you and say, oh, oh, you're a rotten Christian, John. Look what you're doing here, John. Oh, you're not a very good Christian. You can speak to the devil in relation to these things. Say, hey, hang on. Hang on. I knew what I was doing when I got baptised. But let's move on because there's more. I, I notice also that it's saying here that, um, you know, you've been baptised into Christ, not a particular denomination, not a particular brand of Christianity. You're baptised into Christ. But then there's something else. Paul was writing to the Galatians. And this is what he says in Galatians 3. He says, so in Christ Jesus you are all called children of God through faith. For all of you were baptised into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've been baptised into Christ and you have clothed yourself with Christ. What does that mean? It means you've put on the uniform. It means you've put on the uniform. See, in the same way, if you were working for Coles or Woolies, you would put on a uniform because you were representing that company. When you join the army, you put on a uniform and you were representing the Australian Army or the Australian Navy or whatever it is. And Paul is saying here, when you are baptised into Christ, you actually clothe yourself, you put on the uniform. 
Have you put on the uniform? You see. Now you might say, well, maybe I did it back then, but for the rest of us who have walked for the Lord, is the uniform still on or is it in tatters? You see, what's the uniform? If you were to, to join a particular club, even if it was a bike club or any of those sort of things, I think they use the term, you've got to put the colours. You've got to get certain colours. That's what you're doing when you're getting baptised. You're putting on the uniform. And then when you put on the uniform, then you are to represent the company or the person in our context, we are to represent Christ in the world. That's what it is. Basic stuff. Now, when, when the Lord tells us to do that, there is a reason. But let's go on. Peter, he, he makes another statement in 1 Peter 3.21, and he describes baptism as a pledge of a good conscience. So... My conscience is clean, I've repented, I've turned to the Lord, I'm following him wholeheartedly and, and as a pledge of a good conscience, I'm going to get baptised, I'm putting on the colours. This is who I belong to. Now the thing is this, again, the enemy comes at you and tries to pull you down and says, oh, you're not living up to scratch. You can say to him, listen, I put on the colours. And I'm going to continue to move. I know who I belong to. You don't have any authority over me. Devil, just get out of my space. Why? I've put on the colours. I belong to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's who I represent. You don't have any authority over me. You can yabber, yabber, yabber all you like. I don't listen to him. Don't listen. If you've been baptised in, even in, in, in water, you've, you've repented, you've given your life to the Lord and you've done that. Stop listening to the yabba. You belong, you've put on a uniform. You belong to that family. Okay, let's move on. It says here, So repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. When I repented, that action had happened already. Otherwise, you know, the, uh, remember there were three people uh, on, on, the, on the cross, two others besides Jesus. One guy, he had a change of thinking and he turned to Jesus and he said, remember me when you get into paradise. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me. He didn't get baptised, but he, he repented. He had a change of thinking, you see. He, he had a change of thinking. So some people have said to me over time, oh, well, you know, uh, yes, well, I, I'm a believer and I, I've repented and I'm following the Lord, but I don't know if I want to go through all of that. Um, and then they'll throw at me. Oh, yeah, remember the thief on the cross? Well, he didn't have to do it. And I come back to them and say, yes, but he only had a, through, uh, a few hours to live. You see, what we're talking about here is a good start for the long distance. You can use this. You can use your baptism to fight against the enemy's attacks against you. It says here, okay... Get baptised for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, forgiveness happened at repentance, but baptism seals it. It says, oh yeah, I was fair thinking about that. Now some people get baptised and they don't have any idea about all this sort of stuff. I think you need to let them know. This is what... This is, this is the implications. There is depth here that you can use for the future. Sometimes in all the excitement we get people baptised. But you've got to t if, if they don't know straight up, you've got to teach them to them afterwards so they can use what it means. Everyone's gone quiet. Okay, that's all right. You can use it against your confusion. But then there's more. Let's go on. 
And it says this, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Peter here is pointing to the event that's just happened. Good Bible college teachers tell you, look at it in this context. You wanted to get the first meaning of the, of the passage? Look at it in this context. Here the Holy Spirit has been poured out. There has been this great demonstration of people who seem to be uneducated, were, were speaking the wonders of God, they were speaking in tongues, they were, there was a great release of the Holy Spirit. That is what Peter is talking to. This is the context. Okay, And, and he points to what the Holy Spirit has done. You see, the normal Christian birth, there's a response to conviction, there's repentance, there's baptism in water, and there's baptism in the Holy Spirit. Those things together give you a good start. And, and, and in our Christian walk many times, we've got big gaps in the whole lot. You see. And, and I don't think that's the way it's meant. You know, if you repent and give your life to Jesus Christ, as soon as it is appropriate, as soon as you get a bit of understanding of what baptism means, you get baptised. No need to wait. You know, just as soon as it's appropriate, as soon as it can be set up, as soon as you get an understanding of what that's about, you can get baptised. You can get baptised in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people repent and they turn to the Lord and they come forward and they haven't been baptised in water but you pray for them and they're so hungry for God they just get so filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, all of these things, there's an order here in the scripture, but sometimes God works the other way as well. But these four things are essential for spiritual birth. You see, some people repent, and as I say, they just point to the thief on the cross and say, that's as far as I need to go. Some respond and repent, but never get baptised in water. You're selling yourself short. You're selling yourself short. There's more that the Lord wants to give. Some people, you know, um, you know, my mother was one of these candidates. She was 50 or in her 50s before she got baptised in water. But I was raised in a Christian home. She knew the Lord. She loved the Lord. But she didn't get baptised in water. One of the reasons was she couldn't, she was a, a, a quiet person, a shy person. Probably in our generation now, people would have said, oh, she's got some sort of phobia. You know what I mean? And there were times when she didn't want to go out, that, that sort of thing. And she battled with that. She, she had a conviction, I, I found out after, for years that she ought to get baptised in water. She couldn't do it. One day she did. See, I got, I got baptised in water before she did. And she, she did it. You see, she pushed through the anxiety. She pushed through because she knew, I, I'm, I, I, I want to put on the uniform. I want to serve Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. And she, and she did that. And I, I can still picture it. I can still picture her going into the water. You see, now the thing was, did it make a difference? Yes, it did. Because, because she was obedient to what Jesus said and she pushed through that and she did that, her Christian faith became stronger. It became stronger. And this is what it does. And so, but so she was like that. There are other people like, uh, you know, they respond and 
They have the change of thinking. They get baptised in water. But don't get baptised in the Holy Spirit. And I was one of those candidates. It didn't happen for 20 years after my conversion. Mainly because, you know, I didn't have any teaching on it. The, 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 the culture that I was in didn't talk about it and if you did talk about it they t- turned your attention away from what it was about and so for 20 years I lived as a Christian without the baptism, the empowering of the Holy Spirit and I say, why did I wait 20 years? why wasn't I told? you see Don't miss out. God's given us these resources to help us. And this is not the end of the thing. This is just for the beginning. For you and me to live this Christian life in this world right now, knowing we've got security for the future as well. He wants all of that. He's given it to us. Put it into practice. And so that scripture again which says... His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness through whom he has given us... Marie, if you could start playing for us, please. He has given us great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Why miss out, church? So as we look back, we might say, well, maybe. I don't know if everyone's been baptised. I don't know. But let's unpack it a bit more. Have I got a change of thinking? If I started on that journey, is there some other areas where I've got to get a change of thinking and bring my thinking back into line with what God says? Is the Holy Spirit convicting you of something? There needs to be a change, a response to that conviction. Has it been confirmed? Well, maybe you haven't been baptised in water. Well, you can talk to me about that. It's going to get warmer soon. Okay. We can organise that. But if you've been baptised and you've walked with the Lord for a while, has this freshened you again of what actually happened when you took that step of obedience? I did that. You start down, use it against the enemy. No, I did that. I knew what I was doing. I was putting on the uniform. I know who I belong to. Use it. It's there for us. And then, of course, have you been baptised in the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the infusing of power. It's not to do with salvation. This is an infusing of power to help you and me to live this Christian life. It's the doorway for the gifts to be opened up, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss out on it. They're all there for us to be able to use for his glory. Father, let's just pray. Father, we come to you and we're so thankful, Lord, for these things that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, that when we have that change of thinking, that that repentance comes in. I thank you, Lord, for that change of attitude and change of direction.
Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will fine tune us in this area. That what started when we in our first uh, steps with you, that that will continue. That, Lord, we'll be a people that you can fine tune. And there may be some other things where we've got to have a change of thinking. Well, Lord, you show us. Show us how to do it. Father, we've put on the uniform. Lord, if the uniform's got a bit shabby, will you clothe us again? Clothe us. Cover us. Holy Spirit, will you speak to our hearts now? Bring the conviction and help us to respond. We ask in Jesus' name.